So you know I have to ask you. What? Uh, you your, what? your favorite on-screen kiss. Oh, oh. I didn't realize that question was coming my way. Mm-hmm. Okay, everyone. It is time for the Drew's News Podcast, where we're serving up all the news you need. A sprinkle of pop culture, a splash of inspiration, and always with a side of good feels. Today, we're covering everything from Kate Hudson's worst on-screen kiss to a new study that finds social media has been linked to brain changes in teens. And we have my co Pilot here today. It is Rusty Russ Matthews. Yeah, that's right. I'm on the podcast, everybody. Hello. And I, you know. This ain't our first time. I have been here before. And when I'm not here, I listen every week really? to you. I love Drew. And so it's nice to just come back in here and visit. Hi, everybody. And hi, you. Well, I don't know what the news is without you, frankly. Aww. So here we go. All right. I'm ready. Hit it. All right. Should we hit some headlines? You no. Know, yes. First of all, really quickly, I want to just take a quick pause. Will you please tell us about this amazing Ross x Ross collab that you're um, doing because the clothes are so cute and the story behind it is so charming and it's actionable. People can actually buy this stuff. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a judge on RuPaul's Drag Race. Hello, season 15 airing now. And, oh, you know, we know it's the you. best show in the world. Oh, well, I love it so much. And I'll tell you, when you want to go on that show and sit next to RuPaul, what do you wear? I had no idea. And so what I decided to do is just make it. And I met this designer when I was performing in Toronto. Someone was sitting in the front row wearing a jacket way shinier than mine. And I said, take that off. You can't upstage me at my own show. And then I actually <laughs> took it and put it on. And the audience started clapping. I was like, how dare you? It was better than what I was wearing. His name was Ross Mayer. And I decided, let's partner together. So we have designed this entire collection. Every week, what I'm wearing on uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, is shoppable. Is shoppable. Because as soon as the episode airs, you can buy it. Uh, and it's affordable. It's for all gen- it's for all sizes. It's beautiful. It's called Ross by Ross is the, the line because his name is Ross Mayer. I'm Ross Matthews. And I'm so proud of it. I love this. Thank I also you. love that you can have a piece of it. You know, yeah. I love the shoppability and accessibility of yeah, it all. It's accessible fabulosity is how I think about it. I feel like that's kind of you in a nutshell. Aww. Accessible, fast, fabulosity. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. I love you. I'm big on accessibility. I love you more. Okay. All right. Here we go. Let's hit the headlines. <laughs> First up, Kate Hudson recently took Vanity Fair's lie detector test and was forced to decide which one of her former co-stars was the best on-screen kiss she ever had. When shown a picture of Dane Cook, her co-star from My Best Friend's Girl, Kate laughed and said, Oh, no, no, no. Cancel. Cancel. She was like, no, maybe there's bad blood there. I don't know. I don't know. Other A-listers have recently revealed their best and worst on-screen kisses, including Zac Efron, who called his kiss with Zendaya in The Greatest Showman, his favorite kiss ever. Ever. Mm, which makes me feel bad for any girl who's ever dated Zach Efron that you are not his favorite kiss ever, just so you know. But that there was the question was to all those girls out there who were his girlfriends or dated him, they asked who was his best on screen kiss. Oh, so it's different. I think it's different. Okay. So you know I have to ask you. Why? Uh, your, what? your favorite on screen kiss. Oh, oh, I didn't realize that question was coming my way. Mm-hmm. Huh. I will say, as you think, I have asked you before if you on on uh, our show on the Drew Barrymore show, if you've ever had to kiss somebody in a movie that you weren't feeling without naming names, you said, of course, of course, and that's really oh, tough. Oh, 100%. Oh, God. I, I can't even imagine. Oh, it's it's so hard. Anybody ever b- bad breath? Um, No, luckily. Oh, that's my worst fear. That's Yeah, no, it's like it, the breath isn't as bad as the person sometimes. Understood. You know? And then you're just like, ugh, I have to be intimate with you, and I think you're such a dope. Um, <laughs> okay, who is the best? Like, if you could go back, see a scene, and still get the butterflies. Oh, God, why is this plaguing me? Have you ever seen any of your movies? They're really good. You should watch them. I know. I'm like, I'm so lucky. I got to kiss Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> yes. Edward Norton, oh. Adam Sandler, Hugh Grant, Ben Stiller. Oh, my God, you're living my diary is what um, you're living. Um, uh, Dear diary. A Luke Wilson. Oh God, who else? I've gotten so lucky at all the boys I've gotten to kiss yeah. for work. You know, the funny thing is, is that I don't know if anyone else is talking about this, but it's so mechanical. And the second you even if you can get into it, they like y'all cut, or they're like, it's not in the right position, or like you see someone in the background, like, you know, distracted and not caring, and it kind of breaks the moment. Like, 
it it's it's a weird thing to kiss someone in like this more professional setting. Mm-hmm. So you it's never probably like, not as sexy as you would think it was. See, I'm I love. I'm a big fan of movies, right? And so I I like to think about that maybe you guys just got lost in it. You know what I mean? You forgot the set and the crew was there and like all that. You just looked up five minutes later, like oh well, I forgot we were filming. I Nothing mean, I like definitely that. Did, I dated Luke Wilson and Justin Long, and I did movies with them, and that was kind of nice because you're like, we're boyfriend and girlfriend, so it's not, like, taboo and weird. It's hard for me when, like, the man is married because I'm so hosed before bros. Sure. So that's always awkward. I, I'm, like, I always get uncomfortable. What about when you're dating somebody? Did you ever date anybody, like, dating somebody while you had to go to work and, like, make out with somebody at work and then come home? Was that ever weird? A hundred percent, yes. And it was weird? Yes. And jealousy. Yes. You know who's a fun? Um, <laughs> <Go ahead>. I <laughs> I did a film with Patty Considine. Yeah. And um, I loved working with him. He was such a good guy. Great actor, too. Um, brilliant. And we played husband and wife, and we're trying to have a baby. It's this film, Miss You Already, with Tony Collette. And um, it, it, it just, he was, he was such a safe person. And I had just given birth to my daughter, Frankie. And so my hormones were just, like, coming out in buckets. Everything mm. was, like, throwing me over the edge. And he was, like, a safe space for me. And now when I watch House of Dragon, mm-hmm. I'm just, like, I-, I played your, like, wife, and now I can't see you any other way but with the hole in your face. Yeah, just rotting with a like rotting hand. aging yeah. and rotting. Uh-huh. And it's so funny. I'm, like, oh, I did a movie with you, and you were, like, handsome and vivacious and here you are rocking this iconic brilliant like just a character that's kind of like he went to places like I haven't seen other actors go hair and makeup wise it's like that character is like on death's doorstep for a good six episodes and I know that that probably gets you hot for him. You know what I mean? Look at him like, look at him go. That. Sure, he's rotting and his face is off, but <laughs> what? Yeah, that's hot. I, shockingly enough, Ross, it did the opposite. I was like, oh, God, really? Patty was so like alive and handsome when I was playing his wife. And now he really, it's. Because he, he is still alive and handsome, just for the record, but right? But that character yes. like messes you up. It's like, I, I'm, I'm excited to see how Patty like convinces everyone else on the planet that he's not that like, Hole in the face crone that he plays in House of Dragons. See, I love it when people throw vanity completely out. I oh, think. he he did more than any yeah. other actor I've ever seen on the planet, yeah. and it is a brilliant performance. You you have to hand it to him if he still had that hand there. <laughs> <'Cause> it's <laughs> rotted off now. <laughs> you can't. I mean, I feel like a, a mouse was about to crawl through his eye socket. It was so gross. I think watching one did that. at one point. Yeah. Oh, it's so Poor good. Guy. Um, on the topic of relationships, a woman recently went viral for writing about how she recovered after her high school sweetheart of over 10 years suddenly broke up with her. Julia writes that after their 10-year relationship where they moved to two different cities together and they talked about marriage often, it took her nearly two years to grieve the breakup. But in that time, she has learned how to practice self-compassion, ask for help, find gratitude after the grief, and even forgive her ex for ending their relationship. I mean, okay. Yeah, I think you should. I'm glad you forgave your ex. But, like, can we also thank our ex? Because somebody had to end this. I'm sorry. Like, it's true. We all in those younger years get in these relationships that are sort of, they define us, I think. You know, when you're in, uh, these are high school sweethearts and you're 20, you kind of think, well, this is who I am forever. But really, you are still, like, half-baked at that age. You know, you still need some time in the oven to cook. And I love when you see people who are 85 and they've been together since they were you know, 15 or something, great. I'm so glad it worked for you. Let's go back to real life now. I think, you know. Or the majority of The people. majority of us. Like, I was in a 10-year relationship, and I was not great at it, and I was t- terrible, but I learned so much in, in that time. And that's what sort of primed me and got me ready for when it was right. I think what has happened to her, this 10-year relationship and now a couple years to find who she is, prediction, she's going to be, like, married in two to three years. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Because that's the kind of stuff you go through that teaches you what you can't learn unless you actually do it. I also just like the positivity of it, the not sort of, you know, um, 
being angry at or feeling sorry for yourself or staying stuck or even giving the sentiment of, you know, I was robbed of these 10 years, you know, or I have nothing to show for it now. Mm -hmm. I know those are typical pitfalls that we can all fall into when we've dedicated a portion of our life to being with someone else. But there are just no real way to learn the lessons without the experience. Totes, and I know it sounds cheesy, but you do think in those moments, you know, I bet if you've been in relationships that ended, you think, God, did I just waste five years of my life with this person. But no, you're not wasting anything because if if you're paying attention, you are learning something you're going to take into your next relationship, which sounds, I know, like people who are in the middle of it right now, they're like, ugh, it's so cheesy, but it's totally well, true. Also, I'm going to, you know, address the female elephant in the room, which is some women who have a ticking biological clock yeah. and can only have children and have a family by a certain age, they do t- tend to worry, oh my God, did I waste five or six years investing with this person because all of the sudden now, I think what's interesting is we are starting to adapt in society such a more open lifestyle, let alone dialogue of people can have children on their own. They can, you know, do via surrogate. They can engage with a friend. They can adopt. It's a different world. We're not saying like a family is a man and a woman and a picket fence and Mm -hmm. 2.5 kids and we're not in the 50s anymore. Um, But it is difficult when you're a woman having been with someone for years because you got to think, then you have to meet someone. Then you want to get to know them for a while. You, you know, a lot of people don't want to be pressured right away or they don't want to jump into a family dynamic right away, nor should they. They should be certain if they can of something. Um, And there's no real right or wrong way to go about it in my humble opinion and my lack of judgment to people. But I know it's tough for women sometimes who literally go like, now I can't. And there have probably been, I know there's been relationships out there where if someone leaves you and you've been with them during those pivotal years of 30 to 40, it's really tough, and and mm. it is a different conversation, mm. um, and not exactly the one we started having with this high school sweetheart. She's, I think, got a whole window in front of her, and it's just, you know, I'm I'm glad that she has that time, and I know it's hard for women who like think, oh my god, that w- window is closed. And that's what can lead to, I think, a real devastation of investing time and thinking I don't have what I hoped to show for it in the end. But Mm. if you are outside of that ticking clock window, then you should be excited for the experience and never regret anything because yeah. it's so informative and necessary. What else is living a life all about? Yeah, right. The experience and the connection and the try again. But, you know, I love having these convos with you because that's something that's just not on my radar. When you talk about women in that zone of 30 and 40, if they want to have children, you know, that is a time to sort of think, oh, God. So when you're, okay, hold on. This is like an, uh, I'm having an epiphany, uh-huh, a moment. moment. I, Thank all my you, friends, Oprah. yeah, who I've been, all my girlfriends who I've been like, just go have fun until you meet the right. Uh, no wonder they're feeling such pressure to like meet somebody. Of course, there's a clock on that. And I, I never thought about that before. Yeah. Whoa, that's a whole different thing. I know, it's really I'm tricky. so glad I'm not a girl. I got to tell you, I would be so stressed out. It's so easy being me. It really <laughs> (laughs) is my I'm like what what day you want to do happy hour that's my biggest concern wow and yet as a woman I'm telling you if any girl is you know or man for that matter is lucky enough to have you in their life everything's going to be okay oh I love you it's true I love you I'm seriously sorry to every girl I've pressured to go just just calm down and just it'll happen when it happens I get it now I take it back uh, some people do need to calm down and stop stressing. Though, okay, good, because so. I don't really take it back. I mean, a lot of you do <laughs> just need to chill out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to go to a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back with exciting, interesting news about Wes Bentley from Yellowstone. And 
And we're back. Okay, Yellowstone star Wes Bentley, who was so amazing in American Beauty and kind of came onto the scene and just was revelatory. I'll never forget that, watching that movie and being like, who is he? Right? Exactly. You and everyone in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the American public. Absolutely. Well, he recently opened up about drug addiction and how it deeply impacted his career leading up to his role on the hit show Yellowstone. Because as a young adult in the entertainment industry and after his success in American Beauty, Wes said it was all vampires and underdeveloped young people. He said the regrets are always going to be there. But he has been sober since 2009 and is happily married and has a whole life now that he really feels good about. Um, Thoughts? Well, it's interesting that when he says uh, the regrets are always going to be there, I'm curious what you think about regrets. Do you think they're healthy to have? Or do you think it's just um, a weight and a waste of time to focus on things you can't change? The only things I truly regret in life is anything that I've done to sabotage my health. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. That I regret. Mm-hmm. And I can't take it back. And I just, I, I'm always concerned. I, you know, I smoked, I've drank, I've beat up my body. I didn't eat healthy for a lot of years. And, you know, how... And, you know, how's that going to impact me in the long run? And where does that show up Mm -hmm. in certain ways and places? And for that, I have a perpetual fear, for sure. Interesting. Um, Other than that, I regret nothing. Mm -hmm. And I really encourage people not to have regrets because you just can't change the past. You can change your future, though, because of the past, going back to – the experience, the life, the things you learn, what you've been taught, how you grow, that's all going to save the looking forward and don't waste your time looking in the rearview mirror. So that's like, that's how I feel about regrets. I feel pretty much the same way. I always used to say no regrets, no regrets, no regrets. But I, I do think it's okay to look at your past, whether it's with your health or your behavior or something and sort of say, um, and hold on to it in terms of not to get lost and I wish I would, I wish I could, I wish I did this, but to think I will never do that again. I will do this again. I learned from that. And it's sort of like a, a line through some of these stories we're talking about. Yeah, about there the, is a reoccurring theme here. Right? That like life experience is valuable in, in, if, if you use it to go forward. You know what I mean? That's the best part about living is that you're sort of armed with what you didn't know before. And, you know, you can stop making those same mistakes. Also, you know, I think it was in season two. I mean, I always was so honest about, you know, everything in my life pretty much. But for some reason, season two became like a real mission for me, you know, with you and sort of doing stuff on digital for the show, which was like, I want this to be an invitational place. Why should we pretend that we are veneers with no past? Mm. So when a Wes Bentley, you know, who probably didn't have to disclose these things, is like, yes, everything looks great now. But it there have been times in my life where I really struggled. And I think when certain people hear that, it's just extremely comforting and non-alienating. The hardest thing is when you feel so alone, so isolated, so lost, you know, so disconnected from other people. And so it's like when you hear somebody go, oh, man, I had demons. I got led down the wrong path. I fought my way back. I'm thriving now. That's the kind of invitation and realities and stories I want to hear from people. And then you get to the humor and the awesomeness, and it's like, Listen, it's just not all perfect and rosy. You fall off. You get back on. That is life. So I applaud him for bringing people into his life experience when he probably didn't have to. Absolutely. And it's another through line in this conversation, Ali, that we're having, this accessibility. I think these honest conversations are so accessible to audiences. I think it's why you resonate. I think our show resonates is because no matter where anybody watching is on that journey of falling on the horse and getting back on, they see that reflected in you. No matter where they are, they see it. I can never see that in myself because I just don't have that ability. Like Mm -hmm. I don't 
want to know what other people think and feel about me, but I like him more now, for sure. Yeah. So if that's what you're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Cool. Okay. It, it, ex- I see it with Wes Bentley. Yes. Accessible <laughs> and fabulosity, but accessible um, humanity. I, I mean, if people are going to talk about their problems and then just stay stuck in them and sit in them and like let the room stink up, I don't want anything to do with that. No interest. Thank you, next. I want to hear about the scars and the triumphs. Yeah. And like... Um, the drive, the drive to 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 be the best version of ourselves, yeah. even in the messiest version of ourselves. Oh, you know? I love a good mess, Ross. Thank you. I love a hot mess. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the topic of social media, there is a new study from the University of North Carolina that has identified a possible link between frequency checking social media and brain changes that are associated with having less control of impulse behavior among young adolescents. Oh, God. I just got a pit in my stomach as a parent. Yeah. What does this mean exactly? I'm trying to wrap my head around this. It's- well, I mean, I, I just went to myself. The second I get a device in my hand, I keep checking things I don't need to, like the oh, weather yeah. or Instagram or text. And then it's like uh, uh, the moon, you know? I yeah. want to know where the moon is. And then I'm like, wait, did I check the text? Oh, wait, no, I've already done that. Oh, wait, some news stories. And it's like, I am a rat on a feeder. No, it is like an addiction, it feels like. For me, I grab when I wake up in the morning, it's the first thing I do. And then there's just like this like routine, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, da 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 And there's nothing new when I go on, but I do the rotation. And it's like almost, what was the, like, they call it an impulse here, an impulse, impulse behavior. Control. That's what it feels like. I'm like, why am I refreshing? What am I looking for? And and by the way, you just did it 10 seconds ago. There's still nothing. I know. And yet it's that like rat on a feeder Mm -hmm. that I really relate to. And I'm like, oh, that's impulse control. And if young kids are having that depleted, that's a bad time to be losing sight of how to control impulses. Sure. And I also think about the great thinkers and the great artists of, you know, human, human the span of humanity. What would happen if, like, Leonardo da Vinci had Twitter and was just refreshing rather than <laughs> creating the next masterpiece? You know what I mean? Like, what kind of masterpiece could we be creating if we weren't checking Facebook, Drew? You know? What was Leonardo da Vinci's version of Twitter, though? The town square, literally? I, yeah, I guess it was the literal town square. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like carrier pigeon. <laughs> um, you know they had hot goss back in the day. I that's, know. That's been happening, like, you know, like, back <laughs> in, like, really, like, beginning of man times. Totally. Someone and woman times. Someone was like, Sally is just really pissing me off right now. Totally. I would have she a She is not carrying her weight in the cave. No. Like, I cannot handle this. We write ye old gossip column just yeah. with a feather pen. <laughs> a quill. A quill. Yeah. A feather pen. A quill. Yeah. Uh, I'd be like, dear Abby. Lady whistled lower. <laughs> whistle down. Whistle down. Totally. Yeah, yeah, totally. I know. But I mean, think about that. Like, so... These great thinkers who are now being born or are now in their, you know, 20s or something, are they distracted by technology and not doing what they're meant to be doing? I mean, time will tell. Time will tell. I know because we it's still like it's here's a phrase I hadn't heard until the other day. Someone said uh, I gen as in like the. Oh, God, that's good. Isn't it so good? Where has that phrase been? I, Jen. Because I'm like Gen Z, millennial. I'm a little confused, which is which. That's the next one. That should be it. I, Jen. The other day I was at a restaurant, and they they these adults were all talking, and then the kid was watching an iPad. Oh. And I was thinking like, oh, wow, are they going to learn how to engage or how to sit and be quiet or not be there? And I'm not parent judging. I'm not. I'm thinking about what that ex- life experience is going to be like for that child. And that is maybe iGen. I think it's like the 0 to 10, yeah. you know, as well as the 10 to 20. Like, you know, call it 0 to 15. I don't know. But, like, all of a sudden, it was like I my skin and chills and, like, hair stood up iGen. Yeah, and— and again, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. So if parents who are listening now have done that with their kids, I'm not judging you. But I, I, it's going to be interesting to see what this iGen turns out to be because these kids are also the kids who for three years went to school on Zoom, you know? I thought the other day, um, and I'm, I don't want this to be controversial, um, but I thought about how being um, 
through wars and plagues and civil liberties and everything has been um, cyclical in our world. We take a step forward. We take a step backwards. Mm -hmm. um, we have contended with issues um, time and time again. Um, but the internet is a new thing that we can't hearken back to history and say we're repeating ourselves. We're mm -hmm. going backwards. This is an untested uh, format that we don't know the effects of. Uh, we've never been here before. It's uncharted, right? And um, I, I wish we hadn't been to any of these places, you know, before. But this is something we have no comparison to. Not that we should have the comparison to anything else. Um, I, I mean, I'm so ridiculously flowery and that I wish, you know, we came onto this planet and we took care of each other and we learned to live amongst our differences and we gave each other the room and space for acceptance and that was how the world worked. Mm -hmm. But it isn't the history we know and we're getting into a present that just we have nothing to compare it to. You know, with every like great technological advance, in, and there have been a few of them that have really sort of changed the game with how we interact with each other as humans, right? You think about the telephone, think about how that changed everything. There's always good, and with the good and the advances and, and stuff, there's always sort of the dark part of it. You know, like you look at the dark web, we don't know how that's going to affect us, even with telephones. Telemarketers came, hello, they're annoying, and they're never going to go away either. But in all seriousness, who knows how this is going to, to like the, the internet and all of that, the, the negative parts of it, the way the, proof the isolating parts of it. we can survive it. Well, we have been surviving it, but it's a brand new existence. The human existence is different now than it was before it, you know, and I don't know what that's going to mean for iGen. I don't know. Yeah. I'm raising kids in it and it's, it's, I think it's why I think about it so much because it's, it's going to affect them and they're going to be the example of what that is. Mm -hmm. And we cut to 30, 50, 100 years from now, if we take care of our planet and we're able to be here, we really won't know until then. Yeah. And by then it'll be just a standard passe norm. But we're really in the wild frontier of the unknown right now. Yeah, but it's exciting. It is exciting. Yeah, I do. I do think there's always a polarity to a mm -hmm. positive and a negative, you Totes. know, mm -hmm. so I, I, I get heavy about it when I talk about it, because I, I think it just weighs on me so much as a parent, you know, if it was just me, it would be like, come what may. Mm -hmm. But now that I have these kids, I just I, I everything I, I, you know, weighs on me in such a different way. Wow. So interesting. That's why I love talking to you about this, because it's like you are driving your own car, but then you have these other really important cars that you're taking care of before your own, you know, and I just think I can, I don't know how you function in the world. I mean, it's, I'm exhausted just worrying about myself, dear. I'm a, I'm a lot. By the way, if I make it through this, like without heartbreak and like just, you know, some type of physical failure, because I've never cared this much and I don't even know if it's sustainable, like, it, like, if I make it through as a parent, I will be so happy. I just – sometimes I think it's just going to take me down because I've never worried or cared about anything this much. And can I physically sustain this level of concern? Well, I'll tell you, just like you don't – you can't see yourself and what you're doing on the show. We were talking about that conversation, about how you're relatable and it's helping people in their journeys. You can't see yourself as a parent. So I just want you to hear me that I'm watching you and you're doing a great job. You can sustain it. I love you. You're doing – oh, we're hugging. We're hugging. I love you. No, sometimes you need someone to, to show you, to tell you. What you can't see. I need that. Because I'm a light, happy person, you know, but every person has a dark side. Oh, honey, in the middle of the night when your eyes you blink up, you're like, it's the world, the world. Well, let's go to our last story. Oh, and it's a light one. I love this story. See, that's, you gotta, and by the way, you gotta lighten it up. If you go to the dark side or the heavy, you better pull yourself out or lean on a friend who mm -hmm. will can, uh, what is it when you're on the plane and you, like, you the do ejector? Their air, oh, the ejector button? Yeah, but it's yeah. like, isn't there a word? Yeah, it's ejector button. Right, okay. Okay, yes, <laughs> we all need our injector buttons. All right, our last story. Um, and talk about a real catastrophe. A curious <laughs> feline was feeling frisky and adventurous on a recent United Airlines flight and escaped from its carrier. 
The cat roamed the plane's cabin until it was eventually caught by a flight attendant who brought it around to passengers asking politely, is anyone missing a cat? Aww. Ultimately, the cat was reunited with its owner, Rossi. I, I mean, come on. Why couldn't I be on this flight? Can I tell you something? If a little kitty walked up to me on a flight, I'd be the happiest human. You know, I know that there are safety protocols we need to follow, but if animals could just roam yeah. around a plane, think about, like, the joy, the comedy, the mm -hmm. surprise and delight, mm -hmm. you know? Other than, like, the poop and pee part, I just have to say, I wish more animals were on more flights, roaming free and coming up and surprising you. Like, give me that Dr. Doolittle airline, uh -huh. and I will be a mm -hmm. loyal customer. Do uh, you know what they call this airline? It's a, a feline airline. And do you know, okay, do you think... <laughs> Do you, you want to hear the really worst joke that I have? Uh -huh. Do you think this cat was in coach or first clause? <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> Just give me Air Kitty any day. Air Kitty! Air Kitty! Oh, my I God. I want to fly. That's what I consider the friendly skies. Yes. It's an animal-riddled flight. Thank you. Oh. Well, you know what? That's what we need in life, you know, right when we sort of get you know, a little heavy in our heart. It's just like, where are the humorous stories or the fun little anecdotes or the little pop cultures or the funny little, you know, facts and, and human moments uh, or animal moments that occur that just kind of like bring you out of your own weird little slump. Mm -hmm. And that's what I always wanted to do here with this news is like, just when I need it most, I hear about a cat roaming around a United Airlines flight, and I'm right. I'm on that flight right now, watching that flight attendant like holding the cat. Like, excuse me, are you missing a cat? Like, and I just feel better. I feel better too because if there's turbulence, you just go. No, that cat's got nine lives. We're fine. We're fine. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> well, everybody out there, uh, Ross, you're on um, Drag Race. Oh yeah, Drag Race season 15 airing right now. Now, every oh Friday night on MTV, the highest ratings MTV in like six years. It's, a, it's just great. The show is phenomenal. I'm so proud to be on it. It has so many spinoffs. It's such a powerful thing. It wins Emmy after Emmy. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you so proud? Mm, beyond, beyond. And, it, you know, it, we, it, we've we been doing the show forever. And it just is the same show we've always done. Like me, Rue, Michelle Visage, Carson Kressley, which always just trying to put something good out in the world and make each other laugh. And it just feels like the rest of the world caught up to us at a certain point, you know, and, and now it's just become a juggernaut. I love the combination of a powerful business and something that makes the world a better place. Totally. And that's what intersects with you guys and your show. Yes. All right. Well, follow the Drew's News podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like, you know, I don't know, want to like tell that cat on that United Airlines flight, like, hey, you should listen to the Drew's News podcast. Or, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. Like, who else would you tell, Rossi? You did uh, the pilot. <laughs> tell the pilot. Uh, listen to Drew's News. And by the way, there's a cat back in e EF. G or whatever the seat is. I what think, airline is that? ESG? I don't know. A big one. No, <laughs> Old you, McDonald Airlines? Yeah, well, <laughs> e -I -E -I, I'm in seat. E-I-E-I-O. No, but uh, tell your friend, tell your sister, tell your, your grandma and them that uh, Drew's News is every week uh, with Drew Barrymore. I love that you do this podcast. It's an extension of what we do on the show. It's the kind of news you want to hear about. I love that it's all the feels. News and I, you can use. Yeah, I, I love that you let us go there. Thank you, Drew. No, I love you so much. This is so much fun. All right, everybody. Everybody, as we always say, we make this show for you, so take it with you.